Power shell get. Yeah, I got the button. We got it. Got it covered. Uh, so what, what is PowerShell Get? It's a new module in PowerShell version 5. And I call it a new feature, but it actually is a module with eight commandlets. And it's an easy way to install, to discover, install, and update PowerShell modules. Because, uh, and let's just flip through the slides. We've got a little more information about that. But I'm, I'm a Microsoft MVP, a Sapien MB, MVP. I, uh, I've co-authored one book and I've been a contributing author of another one. I, uh, I'm the winner of the advanced category from the 2013 scripting games and also the leader and co-founder of the Mississippi PowerShell user group. So I've got some questions for the audience. So who has used PowerShell version 5? Okay, good. And out of those who have used PowerShell version 5, who has used PowerShell Get? Good. I've got some basic information because I figured there would be a lot of people who have not used PowerShell Get, but then we'll do some deep dive information that'll help you as well. And if any of that kind, some of it is stuff that may help you down the road when you're trying, trying to troubleshoot a problem. So are you writing modules today? And if you're writing modules, are you putting your functions, if you're doing script modules, are you putting your functions directly inside those modules? Or are you dot sourcing external functions with those modules? Uh, or, or maybe you're, uh, you're writing binary modules. And any of those will actually work with PowerShell Get. I've actually tested those. So it doesn't matter how you're writing your modules, if it's a binary module or if it's a script module, or if it's an external function, when you publish those modules to uh, a NuGet repository, it'll actually pick up the functions. So what about module manifest? Are you creating module manifest files for those modules? If you're not, you should be. And it's a requirement for PowerShell Get. You won't be able to publish your modules without a manifest. So they're just, they're just making you do what you should already be doing anyway. And what about sharing your modules? You know, maybe you're still using SneakerNet and you're putting them on a USB drive and sharing them with a coworker, or putting them on a file share somewhere, or maybe you write modules and you don't share them with anybody. Or maybe you're sharing them publicly, and that's actually what I do a lot. I write them in such a way that there's no company information in there, and I'll put them on like GitHub or somewhere, so that way anybody who wants it can have it. I'll just write them open source. And while we're talking about GitHub, let's talk about source control. Are you using some type of source control today for your PowerShell code, and specifically modules? Uh, there's, there's numerous different systems, you know, like I mentioned GitHub already, and then uh, Sapien's got a product called version, I think it's called version recall. Or maybe you're using something like Visual SVN, I've used that in the past. But PowerShell Git can be used for like a simplistic, it's not designed for source control, but as you'll see through the demo, it can be used for a simplistic source control system. And of course, this is the, uh, this session's based off the WMF5 preview, so everything in here is subject to change. And it's changed with, with each iteration of PowerShell version five, there's been changes to like parameters and even some commandlet names. So let's talk about what we're gonna cover. And I don't have very many slides, I'll be honest with you, and you'll, uh, you'll see a slide in a couple of minutes that'll tell you why. So we're gonna talk about finding, installing, publishing, and updating modules. We'll talk about repositories. We'll talk about PowerShell Gallery, which is the default Microsoft repository. I'll show you how to set up just an SMB file share and use that as a repository. It's not what I recommend, but it's fine for simplistic testing. We'll also, I'll also show you uh, ProGet, which is a third party product. And it's kind of a canned product. Now I don't work for them and I'm not endorsing them, but they have a free version. And it doesn't do things like LDAP integration and, and so on. So you would look, need to look at their licensing model to see if you can use the free one or maybe you need to buy a better one. And also we'll demonstrate creating a NuGet repository with Visual, Visual Studio. And I'm not a developer, so if I can do it, you can do it. 
So why are you here? Are you here to learn more about PowerPoint? <laughs> well, I hope not because sadly you'll be disappointed. Hopefully you're all here to learn about PowerShell Get. If you're not, you're in the wrong place. And what's that mean? It means it's demo time. And notice I had to hack the master slide to get that on there. <laughs> So let's make sure Microsoft hasn't killed our uh, internet connectivity. Okay, so we're good. Only need it for the first part of the demo. And I'm sure that everybody can see that font, right? As small as it is, but that's part of the demo. Hey Mike, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. Could you help me understand uh, the difference between, I've seen so many XGET stuff out there, one get, PowerShell get, there's an older product called PSGET. Don't confuse that. That's not a Microsoft product. I'm not really sure what that is, but uh, don't confuse that. There's also one GET. Yeah. And I'm going to show you during the demonstration that all PowerShell GET is. PowerShell GET is a script module if you didn't know that. <coughs> so it's like 3,500 lines. You can just read the code. It's self-documenting. You can know everything there is to know about it, except that most of the commandlets are simply wrappers around the one GET commandlets. And if we have time, I have some bonus content where I'm going to rename my PowerShell GET module so it doesn't exist, and I'm going to show you that I can do everything that I'm going to do with PowerShell GET in one GET. Now, the only thing that you can't, the publish module commandlet, and I'm going to pull the commandlets up, so, uh, so let's pause that, for that thought for just a second. So anyway, if I'm going to zoom in the font, why not do it in PowerShell? And then this is a tip that I learned from uh, Ashley McGlone, the GoTPFE, is put break at the top of your script because if I accidentally hit run all or F5, then the demo will be over. But uh, no, matter, no matter where my cursor is, it'll break at that point. So if I, if I actually hit run all, it'll just break. Doesn't matter where the cursor is. And the only reason I don't have that at the top is I wanted to zoom in before I showed you that so you would be able to see what I was doing. So I need to be in my demo folder. Of course, like I said, I need internet connectivity. I've got a few variables I'm going to define, and it's just mainly to, uh, to make the code narrower. I don't want these long paths. I'm not used to such a high resolution uh, projector. I'm used to these older ones that are like 1024, 768. So I try to keep my code as narrow as possible. Just to show you what version of PowerShell that I have installed on this machine, it's the February preview. So as far as prep, and normally that's stuff I would do before a demo, but you guys are PowerShell guys, so I figured you could appreciate it. So let's talk about uh, PowerShell Get Basics, because I don't want to jump in and just assume that you guys have already used PowerShell GET because I've already asked those questions and every, not everybody in the room has used PowerShell 5, much less PowerShell GET. Okay, so uh, we'll just send the commandlets to OutGrid view. And on this screen, I, I'm going to give you some other tips as we're going through it. Who needs Zoom It? Because you can actually do Control Plus and Zoom In on OutGrid view. So talking about the commandlets, they're very descriptive. That's why I like PowerShell. Find module is how you find or locate modules in a PowerShell GET repository. Install module is how you install modules that exist in a PowerShell GET repository on the machine. And you can actually pipe the results of find module to install module. Publish module, of course, is how you upload or publish a module to a repository. And what that commandlet does, it runs NuGet. And it actually runs, it runs NuGet pack. So it packs it as a NuGet package, and then it does a NuGet push. So it actually pushes it to the repository because like I was talking about the one get commandlets, there's not a corresponding one get commandlet that it can use behind the scenes. Update module is kind of tricky because a package can, it's how you update modules. You would use that commandlet for updating modules but you can only update a module from the same repository it was previously installed from. But that information is stored in an XML file, so if you ever got in a bind, you could actually hack the XML file and point it to another repository. 
GetPS repositories, how you return a list of the repositories that are currently registered on your computer. Register PS repositories, have you register a new repository. And set PS repository is how you make modifications to an existing repository that was previously registered so you don't have to remove it and re-add re it. An unregistered PS repository, of course, is how you delete a repository that you've registered. Now, in previous versions, you could actually de delete the default repository, but in this build, you cannot. And I even went to the one get level and tried to delete it, and I couldn't delete it. Because to me, once you set up a private repository, you may not want the public repository registered. If you have any questions, just feel free to stop as we're going. I just seem to cover them as we go. So get PS repository. We have one repository registered. It's PS gallery. Notice that the installation policy is untrusted. It points to powershellgallery.com. I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know this was a website until about six months ago. I knew I could interact with PowerShell, but I don't use the GUI enough to know that it's a website. There's some great information out here. I'm not going to cover it all, but there's 151 unique modules on the gallery. There's something specific I want you to see. So I went to the Get Started uh, tab. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom to show you how, how this is built with uh, on top of OneGet. So I want you to see this part. My arrow is not too straight, but it's good enough. This part and this part. Of course, I am using Zoomit for this. So you'll notice that uh, PowerShell Get heavily leverages the one Get infrastructure, and install module is actually a thin wrapper around install package provider PS module. And notice how it sits on top of one Get. The important thing about this is there's been a lot of builds of one get. I actually broke my one get. If you break your one get, well guess what? Your PowerShell get's not gonna work either. So if your PowerShell get is not working, make sure one get is working. And what one get is, is a package manager manager. You can install packages, like I had a demo I was doing and I would install things like WinRare and Zoomit and so on. And uh, this session really is focused on PowerShell get but we will talk about one, one get just a little bit. Okay, so if I want to get a list of all the modules in the, repos in the default repository in PowerShell, I'll just run find module, and I'm outputting this to a variable so that I can get a count on it. So I can see, as the GUI previously said, there are 151 modules, and those are unique. So you could have 10 versions of the same module, but that'll count as one in this, in this list. And I'll be providing this script, and you can see it's heavily commented. So those are notes for me, but there'll also be information that you'll know what context these commands were run in. I previously exported these with the commented out commands because if we had internet connectivity issues. So if I just want to find, say, the GIA module, I can just specify GIA or XGIA. But what I want you to notice is when I run it with a verbose parameter, it tells me that the repository parameter wasn't specified, so it's going to search all the repositories. And the reason I want you to be aware of this, I recommend using the repository parameter if you know what repository that the module is in. If you're away from your network or you have repositories that are not registered, that are not available, it's like it queries them serially, so it, uh, you have to wait a considerable amount of time for those repositories to time out if it can't communicate with them. So if you want quick results, point it to a specific repository. So when I specify the repository parameter and use, run the same command, I get some details about the actual repository that I queried. And you'll see that it's not like as trusted as false. As I, as I said earlier, 
you could use PowerShell Get. It's not designed to be a source control, but it can be used as a simplistic source control. It's going to make us IT pros do a little bit of source control, whether we want to or not. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one that's guilty of maybe writing a module or some PowerShell code, and two weeks later you've rewritten it, and you're like, you know, I didn't keep a backup of that old copy, and I can't remember how I did something, and I wish I had a copy of it now. I'm sure most people are probably guilty of that. Well, when you publish a module, it's going to keep all the old versions. So if I wanted version .2 of, it, of GIA, I could actually go out there and install that version. When you're using find module, it, it does accept wildcards. So I'll do star EA. You'll notice the only thing that ends in EA is, is the XGIA module. If you look at the help, and of course, the help is not finished because the module is not even finished. It'll tell you if you do this search with just EA, if there's not a module named EA, it should give, in, give you an error or not return any results. That's actually not the case. What it did, it found any module with EA anywhere in the name. So it's like it implicitly adds wildcard characters. And believe it or not, I did some testing, and when you don't put any wildcards, it's actually faster than adding the asterisks. And I ran this numerous times with, uh, with the uh, measure command. I think it's measure command. <coughs> so I'm going to validate that XG is not installed on the local computer. It's not. I like writing my commands this way. It kind of reminds me of SQL, where I can do a find, or in SQL I would do a select. I can see uh, that's the XGIA module, and then I can actually pipe it to install module. I want you to notice this prompt. It says, are you really sure that you want to install software on your computer from an untrusted source on the internet? And we're going to say, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Trusted, though, it's, it's Microsoft running the gallery, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and that's, it trusted? <laughs> it's, uh, that's the default setting that Microsoft decided to choose. And it's, to me, it's because it exists on the internet and you don't know the people that actually publish the modules. It didn't go through your internal quality control process. So that's that, that leads me to another question. Um, with with the modules that are in the repository, are they just made by individuals? Or are they made by corporations? Or uh, Currently, it's limited access. So only people like MVPs and the PowerShell team. There is a request. So uh, I'm not sure if just anybody can get access. But the majority of them are uh, MVPs and Microsoft staff. Mike, can you change how it's displayed? Can you actually trust the repository? Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to show you something else so you can actually install without that prompt, without having to change that policy. And I have one more. Sure. Since you're able to list all the various versions, the previous versions, are you able to target a specific version instead of 2.16.5, you wanted 2.15.1? Yep. Okay. Well, good. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> actually, we're going to do that. <coughs> So around the, the population who's allowed to contribute to the gallery, uh, right now it's being seeded by higher quality content, people who are MVPs and write useful stuff, but that's not necessarily true in the future and it will never be audited by Microsoft or by the company. So realize that this is just any old person in the future, this will be any old person putting up modules. It's kind of your decision whether you trust it, whether it does what you want it to do. So for example, there's a toolkit out there that penetration testers use for doing penetration testing with PowerShell to see you know, when they're paid to whether they can compromise a network. That's up there. So really important to realize the fact that it's being hosted is different than making any sort of evaluation based on content, which only you can do. So it won't be like chocolatey or anything that's at least semi-moderated? Correct. OK. Uh, we are. We do have a. We do have a. We're going to have a rating system, right? Yeah. You know, so people can like you know give it five stars, four stars, one star. Who knows what's happening in the future? Yeah. yeah regard and regardless of a rating system, you, 
got to know what the code is that you're downloading from running your machines. Exactly. Especially when you're downloading PSC resources that are going to be running unattended in the background in your production environment. I'm going to show you how to work around all those problems. I'm going to show you what most companies are going to do. Okay. So we just installed the GEO module when we got the latest version. Because by default, if you don't specify a required version, it gives you the latest one. Okay, what I want you to notice is the commandlets. There's eight commandlets and there's no delete module commandlet. So you have to remove it manually. I mean, there is a remove module commandlet, but that's an older commandlet that has nothing to do with deleting a module. It removes it from memory. So if I would have used, I'm actually about to delete it, and if I would have used a commandlet in the GEO module, it would have auto-imported. I would need to remove it before I deleted it because I ran into a problem testing this demo where I had it loaded. It let me delete certain files like the, uh, the formatting file, but then I couldn't, I had to like exit out of PowerShell and delete it in the GUI, which is horrible. <laughs> so anyway, now I've deleted the GM module from my local machine. So this time what I'm going to do, I'm just going to say install module and I'm going to specify the scope of current user. And I'm actually going to scroll back up. Notice the location where the, uh, the module was installed. I didn't specify a scope, so that's the all users modules path, which is the default. So I actually want this module installed in my my current user module path. And I'm going to use the force parameter, which is going to suppress the prompt to say, are you sure you want to do this? <coughs> the force prompt should have been the, uh, the make it so prompt, or the make it so parameter. OK, so now you can see the location that it's installed in. It's installed in the all users module path. OK. Let's talk just a little bit about install module. Install module doesn't support wildcards. Uh, and the solution to that is to pipe, is to use wildcards with find module and pipe it to install module. I found a bug, I think it's a bug, because if you, if you use wildcards with install module and you do like I did star EA and it only returns one result, then install module will accept that wildcard. If it returns two items, then it will not install it to give you an error with install module. Okay, so let's move along to an SMB repository. So what we're going to do quickly here is create an SMB <coughs> file share on a machine called DC01. Okay, that's been created. And as I said earlier, I'm used to working on much lower resolution projectors. So I'm using splatting with this. You could very easily just put all your parameters and their values out there. So I wanted my code narrow because I refused to use the back tick as a line continuation character because it's an accident waiting to happen. All you need is a single space and then it's it's not escaping the uh, carriage return. So we'll register the repository. We'll verify that it was registered. And you can see indeed it was registered. There's one called SMB repo. I made this one trusted and it's pointing to a simple UN, UNC path. This should only be used for limited testing. And the reason I say that is your test environment really should match production as close as possible. Because if you test, you're invalidating your testing if it doesn't. Notice this module that I have called Mr. SQL. And all the stuff you'll see from me, it'll be Mr. This and Mr. That. If you want to get to my blog and alias, it's MrPowerShell.com because my initials, MR, Mike Robbins, the initials are MR. <coughs> so the version here is 0.0, .0 and that's a key that m more than likely there's not a module manifest because if you don't specify a version, the default version is 1. I've never tried to create a module manifest and specify 0.0. .0. I don't, don't know that it's possible or why you would want to. We'll take a look at a, the files that make up that module. You'll see there's an XML formatting file and there's a PS1 file. There's like three functions. It's a script module. We'll try to publish that module to our repository. You don't need a, uh, an API key for an SMB file share, but it requires you to put that parameter in so you can give it whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You'll notice it couldn't be published. It's because 
it doesn't have the metadata, it doesn't have a module manifest, and the error message is actually, actually very descriptive. It even tells you how to fix it to say new module manifest. I will tell you in the help for new module manifest, don't ever put your modules where, where the example in the text tells you to put it because it tells you to put it in PS Home, which is under the system 32. And at least in my opinion, only Microsoft should be putting modules there. Okay, so we'll, we'll uh, create a manifest. We'll check our module. You'll notice it's at version 1.0 because we didn't specify a version when we created it. Take a look at the files that make up that module. Now we have a PSD1 file. So that is the module manifest file and it's metadata about your module. And I'll actually show you that file. And specifically what I want you to see is in PowerShell version 5, there's a new section that's created, this section here. And notice this part, it says, these help with module discovery and online galleries. So this is added specifically for PowerShell Get. Now the way this is added, it actually is backwards compatible with previous versions of PowerShell. Okay, let's try to publish our module again. And guess what, we got another error. I'm actually guilty of this, this one. I always put an author, but I don't always put a description. Those are two things that are required. And if you went to the PowerShell Get module, and you went to like line 318 in there, you would see exactly they're doing test module manifest, and then they're checking to see if it's got an author and a description. So we'll add a description and just recreate our module manifest. Try to publish that module, and this time it should work. It did work. Let's validate that it's in the uh, repository. It is in the repository. So I'll just show you in the GUI <coughs> that you can see all, all it is is a NuGet package. So let's say, okay, I'm that guy that uh, I made a mistake. I, I had to tweak my code. So I want to push my module up again. Guess what? Can't do it. You, you have to increment your version unless you're going to go to the trouble of deleting that one that exists in the repository. So I'm going to remove the Mr. SQL module from the local computer, verify that it was indeed removed. And now maybe I've rebuilt my computer, I'm on a coworker's computer, just whatever. I've registered the repository and I want to install the module. So I just installed the Mr. SQL module on the local computer. I didn't specify, it actually put it in the all users path because I didn't specify where to put it. Now you'll, look, you'll notice this, it, it appears that I have exactly what I uploaded, but that's not the case and you won't find this content anywhere else because I haven't blogged any of it yet. There's actually a hidden XML file that comes down with that. The PS get module info .xml, and that contains the information of, it contains additional metadata and specifically it contains the repository it was installed from. So that's how it knows where to go update it from. Did you know, and I found this, unless there's a workaround, did you know that you can't open hidden files with PSEdit? This is basically what PSEdit does behind the scenes, so, uh, so I'll just run it instead. So if I scroll down, all the way down, you can see that it's got the repository location that it was installed from. XML doesn't keep anything about the version of the, the yep. version of the module. I believe it does. Yes. Because I mean, otherwise you could just on an SMB share, you could just remake your own NuGet and go drop a new one in there without incrementing the version. And this would never know. It would install right over. Yeah, and I, I honestly do not recommend the uh, the SMB ver uh, repositories. I wanted to show you this for simplicity's sake. 
and when we move to the other repositories, we're going to run through it fairly quickly, but they work. A NuGet repository is the solution you want. If you want to do a proof of concept in your company for some reason, uh, an SMB file share would be fine. So you don't have to go to the trouble of setting up a NuGet repository. So if you look at it in the GUI, I've actually got hidden files and folders turned on. And you'll notice the icon is grayed out. <coughs> okay, what I want to do now, I'm actually, I'm going to make another copy of the Mr. SQL module. And I'm going to, it's going to be version 1.1. And now when I look at the Mr. SQL modules on my machine, you can see that, uh, let's say version 1 is production. It's in the all users path. I'm developing a new version that's 1.1 one, one, and it's in my user path. So I decide, hey, I'm done with version 1.1. Let's publish it to the repository. Guess what? It doesn't know which one you want to publish. So you've got to tell it which one, the path to it. So I'm going to specify the path to it. It'll publish the module. So now you're going to see why I don't recommend an SMB repository. You notice when we worked for the PowerShell gallery, it only returned the latest version. This will actually return everything that's in the file share. So if you try to run install module with this, you've got to use the required version parameter to tell it what version, otherwise you'll end up with an error. Put a version number on the end of the NuGet package? Uh, let's it does. Okay. Otherwise, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be able to store to. The file name would have to be different. Is that a semantic version? You imagine, right? I'm not okay. sure. I can. Uh, I'll be happy to get an answer to that. Though. NuGet supports semantic versioning. PowerShell modules. Okay, so, uh, so we have this SMB repository that's trusted. We've decided with this caveat with the versioning problem that we want to make it untrusted. So we'll make it untrusted. You'll notice that now it's untrusted. So it's that easy to modify this, the uh, registered repository settings. And you might be wondering, okay, where's this repository information stored at? It's actually restored in your, it's stored in your app data folder in an XML file. So, and it's per, that means it's per user. So if I register a repository on a machine and you log into it, that means you won't have that repository. Can we enforce this with GPM? <coughs> you should be able to, uh, You could probably do any of the normal methods, you know, to, to get this XML file updated in this location. So you could actually use DSC or something if you wanted to to get this out there. Can you replace that NuGet EXE with then uh, newer versions of NuGet? Or do you have to use the one that's possible? That new, NuGet EXE file there is actually not used. Oh, it's not. There's another NuGet file that's NuGet any CPU, which is the one that's actually used. Okay. And take it, I didn't develop this module, so I'm talking from experience. Okay. And that's one thing, you know, like I said earlier, I was a co-author of the Windows PowerShell TFM 4th edition, that, along with Jason Helmick. So he's like the instructor that went through the book, and then I'm like the hands-on, the nuts and bolts guy. Because none of this information, you know, nobody's got this content, and, you know, I've had very little interaction with the PowerShell team on any of this. This is me digging through the 3,500 lines of code to figure out what makes it tick. Okay, so what I want to show you here is notice I did it. They must have created that file with export CLI XML because notice what I get when I import it. And that looks very similar to when I run their commandlet, doesn't it? So you know what, with this, with the uh, file, with the uh, versioning problem, with the SMB file share, let's just get rid of that repository. We don't want it. So you can notice that I just deleted that repository. 
I definitely want to cover the ProGet stuff. So let me uh, let me move on to that. What I've done, I've got links to their website and also their silent installation uh, documentation. I've already run that command to install it because uh, I use the C I have an IS web server. I've got like six VMs running here. I've got an IS web server running. And uh, I use the SQL Express, but you can point it to a SQL Server if you have a SQL Server already. You don't have to use uh, SQL Express. I think uh, Steve Morawski actually beat me to this earlier. I had to use this, uh, this little character here. And I was going to ask you what it was. So, and what I'm talking about specifically is this character. It does, but what is it? Specifically, what is it? Stop. Stop. It's an escape character. Yeah. That's what it is. If you if, if you look in about escape escape characters, you'll find that char that character in there. I think it was added with PowerShell version three. Yeah. If I remember correctly. Okay. Well, at least Steve didn't steal, steal the whole thing, you know. Uh, he, did, he did it before I did it, so if anybody stole it, I did. So when you first install ProGet, this is what you get. You get a GUI. That's what we, all those PowerShell guys want, right? A GUI? So you go to the little gear. You log in with uh, admin, admin. The user ID is not case sensitive, but the reason I put it in in that case, that's the case the password is, has to go in as. So then you go back to the gear. I want to manage feeds. I want to create a new feed. And I want a NuGet feed. I'm going to call it ProGet. I'm going to save it. One thing you want to make sure you do, it's got a connector to NuGet.org. Make sure you delete that. It'll give you a warning and say this can't be undone. Yep, I know. Otherwise, when you query your repository, what it's going to do, it's going to it's going to act like everything on nuget.org is in your repository. And what we're doing here, I didn't mention this earlier, but do you actually work for a company who is going to let you install modules from a public untrusted repository on your production computers on your network? Probably not. So you can create your own private internal nuget repository that'll host and maybe you have modules that are proprietary to the company that you can't share with other people. So you would need a private repository. And what I recommend doing is creating your own private repository, pull down the modules and test them, like PowerShell Community Extensions, Keith Hill wrote that, he's PowerShell MVP. And I like using certain commandlets in that module. So I know that it's trusted code. I mean, it's no different than going and downloading it from the internet. So what you can do is grab that module and put it in your trusted internal private repository if you want it. And then all your modules as well, and nobody off your network can, can get to that, that repository. You'll notice there's no packages in my ProGet repository. We'll, we'll just quickly register that repository. It's the same process we were in before. We'll verify that it was indeed registered. We'll publish version 1.0 of our module to the repository. We'll see that it was published. We'll publish version 1.1. And notice this works just like the default Microsoft Online one. We have two versions. It only shows the latest one. Hey, Mike. Sure. Can you send an older version? Haven't tried that. So you can see I've got, even in the GUI, I've actually got a, uh, a module that only shows the latest version as well. If you want the older version for the GUI, you'll have to drill down to other versions. Okay, I'm going to remove the Mr. SQL modules, both of them from PC02, which is the PC I'm working on, the VM. Verify I deleted them. What I'm going to do now, I will use that required version. I'm going to install version 1.0. You can see it was installed. 
Now what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to unregister the ProGet repository. And you can see it was unregistered. So I'm going to try to update my module. What do you think is going to happen? I, the repository it was, re it was installed from is no longer registered. So I'm going to update it. And notice that when we had this repository registered, it was trusted. And now it's prompting me saying, hey, this is not a trusted place. I'll say yes. Guess what? It updated it. What's that allow you, you to do? I could actually install a module on a machine that I'd added a repository from, and then Joel could actually log into it and update that module from the same repository even though he doesn't have it registered. Because the repository registrations are per user, but the XML file that comes down with the module is how it knows where to go back to. So now if we check, we'll see that we have version 1.1. And the XML file that I'm talking about is actually this one. So if I scroll down, that's how it knew where to go. Now that module, take it, it was installed in the all users path, not in the, the current users module path. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, another user wouldn't have access to it. Okay, so we've got about four more minutes, it looks like, if my time's right. I'm going to create a session to uh, three PCs that are running Windows 8.1 with PowerShell remoting enabled. And I'm going to rehydrate some credentials I saved to disk. And uh, I know that, that how to do that is actually documented in the PowerShell cookbook. So I'm going to create another session and I'm going to show you what's in those credentials. So it's Mike F. Robbins. I'm going to create another session to the same computers. So I actually have the latest version of PowerShell on all three of them. I'm going to register a repository and then show that that was registered on three remote computers. Because, you know, I have these three coworkers, you know, uh, Larry, Mo, and Curly, that aren't too good about keeping up with PowerShell. So I'm just going to remote into their machine and do it for them. Okay, so we got an error on one of them. But let's see, uh, we're not going to stop for that error since we're just about out of time. It did install the module. So we have Mr. SQL module installed on these three computers. Okay, now what I want to show you is as an alternate user, when I check to see if the repository is registered, the extra repository, it's not registered. Because I've already shown you that it's, uh, it's an XML file in your app data folder. So we only have the default repository. Okay, so as the alternate user, we're actually, I'm actually going to remote in that does not have the repositories. And basically here, I'm just showing you the same thing that I've already showed you. I'm just running it against three remote computers. So what could have happened is I logged in as me as the administrator, and I installed this module that I registered the repository for. And then, then when Larry, Moe, and Curly logged in and they wanted to update it, they would be able to update it without creating the repository. So. Uh, I think we're about out of time, so I'll jump back to the slides. And the uh, I didn't get to the Visual Studio repository. This is a resources slide that I have. There's actually a really good walkthrough by Bo Prox, and that's like uh, it's the next to the last link there. And there's a uh, some power, a PowerShell team article, a, a link to the uh, PowerShell gallery, and some other MVP. MVPs, and I think uh, Stephen is actually a Microsoft employee. There's my contact info. So uh, blog at mikefrobbins.com, Twitter, the same place. I'm a big believer in personal branding. LinkedIn, email. If you want to email me, you have to go to my about page and solve a security riddle in PowerShell. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know that Gene, Gene was able to solve it in about 30 seconds, and I bet you that Lee could uh, beat that. And uh, 
of course, like I said previously, I'm the uh, leader and co-founder of the Mississippi PowerShell User Group. We meet at 8.30 p.m. on the second Tuesday of every month, and we meet with Link, so it's virtual. We've got people lined up the rest of the year. Most of them are PowerShell MVPs. Ron Edwards is the uh, co-founder of that. He's presenting two awesome sessions tomorrow, one at 11 and one at 1. And he's like the ACL guy. If you've ever worked with ACLs in PowerShell, you know how much of a pain in the butt it is. And he is also doing a DSC and ACL session at 1 o'clock. So be sure to see those. Uh, and I think that's it. Those are the two books that I've taken part in. And be sure to fill out your eval. Now, if you liked my session, my name is Mike Robbins. But if you hated it, my name is Jason Hillman. 